I'm going to use this scene provided with Rise 7.1 Pro to uh, talk a bit about rendering, render to disk, render quality, and uh, and the render options that are available to compare render modes. So at the moment then, the way it's loaded in, we'll go down here, this allows us to get into the render options. So we've got this priority setting which determines how many of the processor cores on your computer are used. So for example mine's a four core processor and it's got hyper threading enabled so if I turn it on to high it will use the four met cores and the four virtual cores generated by hyper threading which means I'll get faster render time so I'll just hit the render button there the big green button does the rendering you can see it's talking about one and a half minutes to render okay and uh, the only drawback of that is because you're using all the processing power available you might find that other applications are unresponsive if you were to uh, to use them at the same time as you were rendering. If we uh, lower the priority to normal then uh, it will leave some processing power available for you to do something else and it may not have that much impact on the render time as you can see the predictions a little bit unstable. I mean it's looking quite similar in this case. What will slow things down is the anti-alias pass. Now because this is a regular render then it does its initial passes which might look a bit pixely and then it'll do an anti-alias pass. So if we go into the render options here you can see where this is chosen. So this is a quality mode. Default, no anti-aliasing, you probably won't use that. Regular, you might end up using that a lot and uh, this means it does its initial passes and then it goes back and does a bit of an anti-aliasing pass and how much anti-aliasing, which is sort of a tidying up of the edge of the pixels, it does is dependent on this threshold value here. So this controls the anti-aliasing and this is only really valid for regular rendering. It doesn't really come into play. Um, you might be able to modify the AA radius for the other rendering modes but this A tolerance is the only thing we're really interested in here. So if this is set to naught, every pixel gets anti-aliased. If this is set to its maximum value then we, when you render, I'll just plop render a little area then you see there's no anti-alias in there and the surface looks a bit gritty or pixely, quite noisy. Now if I go to the render options here and turn it to 100% anti-aliasing, so this is completely intolerant, every pixel will be anti-aliased, you can see that the anti-aliasing pass is much slower, you can see it's progressed down in the bottom left hand corner there, and uh, the overall effect when it's done is less pixely, so it looks finer in detail. If you want to know where the plop render is controlled, there's a little box here on the right hand side, you can toggle this on or off. So if it's toggled off, you can't plop render, it doesn't work, you can just drag and drop the square, nothing happens. Then if you turn it back on, you can plop render different areas and that button does the rendering. Okay, some things that might catch you out if you're not very familiar with Bryce is sometimes you can accidentally turn on panoramic projection and then your preview in the nano here won't match what you get here because you get a 360 degree panoramic render so if you if, it's, if we can trigger this to preview we sometimes just move the camera and it'll do it then uh, you might get a mismatch depending on how the camera is set up and how the preview mode set up so if we switch it back to perspective projection like so then we're back to as it was file revert to saved if you want to start where you were before right so let's get back onto the topic of rendering there's a button here that if you switch switch that button uh, it does a, a sort of preview pass so it'll look like a fast render but you will tend to find there's little artifacts appearing in there so as you can see it says it's previewing it gives you a pretty good idea of the level of detail in, in your final image but uh, there will be certain things that it won't work so well and you can see the with the jaggedness of this edge of the terrain that there's no anti-aliasing on that so materials will tend to look quite a lot noisier and then it'll come back and do an anti-aliasing pass which depending on noisiness of the terrains may take a while so I don't tend to use that preview in very much but it can be handy occasionally I tend to prefer just to hit the big green button there and you know, you'll just got to get an idea of what things are going to look like and then nano preview areas that you need detail on the default setting for the A tolerance as you can see is 15 and depending on the materials in your scene then you can turn this up for fast rendering or down. The AA raise is the amount of sampling, you've got a bit of a selection there, I don't tend to mess with that much, and the AA radius, if you start taking this above one, its maximum value is two, then the image will tend to look a bit softer, that's all the difference that that makes, and the AA radius will be obeyed by other modes which we'll discuss in a minute. 
I've not noticed much difference in render speed with uh, these optimization settings so I just tend to leave that the same 48-bit dithering um, because you've now got the ability to save in a higher resolution color resolution modes when you're just rendering onto the screen then you might want to turn that off I don't usually bother with gamma correction this cause a bit of debate whether you want gamma correction I think you get higher contrast when when it's not engaged if you engage it then things tend to look a bit low in contrast but rendering experts know ways of using this to get better results but uh, if you're a beginner I wouldn't have gamma correction on I'd leave that switched off your choice obviously okay right I did mention uh, the rendering when you hit the big green button you've got also got a button here to the side of the big green button that allows you to halt the render and resume the render which is handy and what does this one do I can't even remember what this one does now I'll probably have to press it and find out let's see there should be a, a tooltip when you go over these you know I really can't remember it looks like it's clearing oh it's clearing and rendering okay that's virtually the same as the the big green button I suppose oh and this one allows you to toggle textures on and off so that uh, can make quite a bit of difference to the render and if you don't know you've set it then you can be quite confused and wonder why you're not getting your textures so that's a good thing to be aware of something else I'm digging back into my memory now oh object masking so object masking and altitude masking and distance masking all relate to things when when object masking when they're selected like this so if you select object mask it'll mask for that object that's selected or whatever happens to be selected if it's a group or a single objects distance masking is distance from the camera and that gives you a grayscale which you can use to generate an alpha map and for further processing in um, in another application and altitude masking well you can see it's another grayscale process you probably won't be very interested in that at the moment but the reason I mention is that you can sometimes accidentally turn these on and it causes no end of confusion if you don't realize it and you're thinking well why is this looking like this where are my textures gone why am I getting this grayscale image so it's just handy to know that they're there right let us talk about uh, render to disk which is down here under file so if you want to output a size of image that is wider than 4000 pixels you'll have to use render to disk uh, it has this print resolution and inch calculation here but it's not really very useful because dots per inch don't really represent anything that's useful for working out whether it's going to be a good print quality it's a bit misleading because a printer dot is not the equivalent of a pixel on the screen a printer dot might only be well in it you know in the worst case it could just be black or white um, if it's including color then it's probably only going to include three colors depending on the quality of your printer whereas a pixel on the screen um, even at standard screen uh, color depth is 256 levels per channel so because of the limitations of the print medium the pixels on the screen are usually I would say in most cases worth more than just one dot on the printer so there's that consideration the other thing is to bear in mind that anything over 4000 pixels really is going to be for a very large image the best thing you could do is to uh, is to no I don't want to do that is to make sure that you need that level of resolution before you you produce such a large render because it will take a long time to give you some idea 4000 pixels across is probably good enough for a2 printing so do some small print test prints and see what resolution you need and then uh, and then if you need high resolution render to disk otherwise render to the screen and you can uh, pause the render and restart the render and things like, oh we've got the tooltips there did you see that resume render let's see what this one says clear and render yeah render flash preview mode textures on off okay I don't know why that didn't appear before but never mind so uh, let's go back to looking at render options then so I'd say for most cases you'll be rendering onto the screen and uh, using regular rendering there is super fine art rendering I wouldn't recommend using that unless it's for a specific application uh, premium rendering is more useful because you can get a good quality output and get the premium effects if you just super fine art uh, anti-aliasing you get race per pixel setting here which allows you to set the race per pixel as per premium rendering but the soft shadows for premium rendering for example will render much more quickly than for super fine art and anti-aliasing in most cases but if you have a soft shadow out source in your scene it regular will recognize that and give you soft shadows in premium you have to turn it on so that's a little bit of a difference there the premium render engine is in fact a different render engine to the regular render engine so 
uh, y you have different controls. Some of these will be greyed out, so you can't take advantage of them. And uh, you have different options to get hold of these premium effects. So depth of field, uh, trambience, which uh, allows you to create uh, better light gathering effects. I have all the videos on these because this is quite a complicated uh, thing to set up to get it right. Uh, but um, if you want to get into doing that, then skip the super fine the fine art and go straight for the premium is what I would recommend, even if it's just rendering soft shadows. Because of the control here, this is the main thing that you want to be concerning yourself with as a beginner. Uh, 16 rays per pixel, so that's how many samples per pixel. You can see the clouds make things quite slow, so that's a drawback of having clouds in your scene but the estimation here of 33 minutes will be the entire render time there is no anti-aliasing pass it anti-aliases as it goes along but for certain applications you will find that uh, this this effect is is rather slow so you have to pick and choose before you get into premium rendering and uh, there are other videos to to, to that go into that in more depth but uh, for the most part as a beginner you will be looking at regular rendering in which case we've already covered that so is there anything else without making this video too long that you need to consider I suppose maximum ray depth would be something that's useful to mention so maximum ray depth is the number of times that a ray can pass through or be reflected off a surface so if you've got transparent surfaces or reflective surfaces in your scene when the ray has been bounced around off those because it comes from the screen from the virtual viewer into the scene and off the geometry and then gets reflected off reflected surfaces it will return black so no, no output once it's run out of ray depth so if you had to, a couple of mirrored surfaces around it would go off one and go off another and if it then encountered a third or fourth mirrored surface it would be returning black at that point uh, same with transparencies so if you've got glass materials in go through the first layer the second layer the third layer and we get to fourth layer it's returning black you can't go any further that's what the maximum ray depth does so if you start seeing large areas of black in uh, your transparent or reflective surfaces you need to turn this value up the lower this value set the more efficient it's going to be um, a similar thing happens when you're using trambient rendering and uh, scattering correction modes the the best mode to be using for that and uh, boost light well, I, I'll go into that in another video, so I won't labor that point. But the thing is, when you're light gathering using true ambience modes here, uh, you have the same limitation with the maximum ray depth. But it's treating every surface to, as as a potential, not reflection, but scattering surface. So when it gathers light, it gathers light from its environment. So it goes to the first surface in front of the camera and gathers light, and then it passes on to the next things that might be gathering light to that surface and so on to the maximum ray depth you'll find that Trambience is a rather noisy rendering mode for this reason because each surface is perfectly diffuse so there's no particular imaging bias that you get with the reflection and as a result it could be gathering light from anywhere that that surface can see so anyway that was probably a, a digression that's a little bit confusing at this point don't worry about these uh, anti-aliasing different modes this is getting a bit more complicated again uh, you would only really start meddling with these if you've got very narrow like wires in your scene and they and when it was anti-aliasing they were vanishing so these different uh, modes that you can set for sampling might be able to pick a final line out better than others other things you can do is increase the level of sampling to try and hit very thin things that in your render in your scene so is there anything else that might prove useful to you hmm. uh, report render time is occasionally useful if you want to make comparisons between render modes so you can get a very accurate report on uh, how long any particular scenes taken to render if you're optimizing scenes that's a little bit specialized i suppose but you might consider if you were going to render this scene at a very large resolution that you could use the uh, report render time on smaller resolution versions find out which is the most efficient render mode with your render options so try different render modes out try your optimizations and then render your big scene and you'll under those conditions that, that you determined which was the shortest render time and you'll get your render out of the most efficient way I've never really troubled myself with that uh, except in very rare cases uh, probably because I'm fairly familiar with what's going to slow things down like clouds for example so we've done revert to saved haven't we um, I suppose one final thing with uh, with rendering that I could mention is when you save your scene so you render your scene and we do we do a render like this and it's got its render time and it comes to an end and uh, let's say we've done that render 
providing it's not been interrupted, so you've done it all in one go, you've not paused the render and restarted it, you actually have more color information than is displayed on the screen. So this only happens when you render on the screen, it doesn't count for render to disk. If you render on the screen, not only can you save your file and get the standard Windows uh, BMP format image saved, but you can also export your image. Now, when you export your image, you have various save options, and some of these, like uh, HDR format, allows you to save with more bits per pixel. So you can actually capture the higher resolution color information that's been stored during the rendering process. This color information is volatile. So if you pause the render and restart it, if you didn't do it all in one go, if you save the scene halfway through a half-finished render and then restart it, you will lose the information. It has to be a render that's completed all in one go from start to finish and then immediately save and you will capture more color information which would allow you to output your scene uh, perhaps uh, for some other purpose. So you, your high dynamic range um, might be useful because you get more color information so you can process your image afterwards and you won't have color banding the HDR uh, formats will take up more memory. You've also got TIFF formats that allow you to save. I think uh, this, the information you've got is at 48 bits per pixel, so you save it at 96, you're not gained anything, but if you have a program that needs it at 96 bits per pixel, then you can do that, that even though the information you've got is only 48 bits per pixel. So there you go, that's probably uh, a bit uh, technical, really. But it is useful to know you've got that option available, particularly if you're thinking about reproducing your images in other media. So, uh, there you go. I've uh, covered a few things there. Oh, 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 one final thing. This is this spray render on-off that you can use to render bits of your image, but uh, I found that it's a little bit unstable and can cause crashing. So, here we go. You can switch on and off with this, then uh, let's see if we get it to render. And then, you, in theory, if we can get the spray render going, you can sort of spray an area in. You can see and see the detail, but it it's uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It does tend to cause problems like that. So uh, there was that. Oh, and the other thing I suppose I should mention is the document setup. So in the document setup here, it allows you to enter your aspect ratio of your scene, the pixel by pixel resolution. Obviously that's going to be useful. Um, there's a few little controls here for, uh, for, for the render settings, but this obviously is a, a legacy bit of the menu because uh, you've got the render options menu now that gives you far more control. And you can do your render resolution. So the document resolution will also be the wireframe resolution, but you can either turn down or up the output render. So if you turn it down to this 1 to 0 0.5, so our wireframe looks like this, but our render looks like that, which can be useful sometimes because you're navigating the scene in the wireframe, and, but you may not need the, the high resolution output. But it, it can just be a case that uh, in the document setup, it's probably best to keep things at one to one and avoid any confusion, and enter whatever values you need. So this this value here, the X value, its maximum value is 4,000. You can have uh, if I just turn comes range proportions, but you can have h larger Y values, but you can't have a larger X value than 4,000. So there you go. I think uh, I think that's enough information for you for now. Hope you found that interesting and useful, and uh, it will help you understand what's going on a bit with the render options in uh, Bryce 7.1 Pro.